Uh, you're welcome, those of you joining me for this session. Uh, today, I want to teach about intercession. I want to speak about intercession. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4 says, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplications, with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. See, God is looking for a man or woman or a group of people willing to stand in the gap for this nation, the United States and around the world, to usher in the great awakening. He's looking for an intercessor who has the passion of the Holy Spirit, who has compassion for his people and is hungry and thirsty for righteousness because it is righteousness that exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. He's looking for someone willing to pray his purpose into human affairs, who wants to see who desires to see the glory of God covering the earth as the waters cover the seas. In Ezekiel 22, Israel was chosen by God as a nation that would usher in the coming of the Messiah. God loved Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. He blessed them. He protected them. He gave them the most beautiful land in the world, but in return, Israel rejected and disobeyed God. Israel began to sin greatly that God was forced to send them into captivity, hoping they would repent and return back to him. But instead, they refused to change and embraced idolatry. They embraced idolatry. Sometimes I wonder if our generation reminds God of Israel. But just as God was looking for a man in the days of Ezekiel the prophet, I feel like God is making the same call who will stand in the gap, who will make a wall, who will stand in the way of sinners offering salvation. God said in Ezekiel 22 verse 30, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. He said, I found no one. See, sin creates a gap between God and man. God wants to bridge the gap between him and his children. So he's looking for an intercessor who will create an awareness of his presence in the universe and bring about repudiation of idolatry because the world cannot do it. The world system cannot do it. The unsaved people cannot do it. They see nothing wrong. The Bible says they have eyes, but they do not see. Why? Because the God of this age has blinded those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of Christ should shine on them. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. See, the word wall he's referring to in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, means to be an intercessor. It means to be an intercessor. Abraham was a man who stood in the gap. Abraham was a man who stood in the gap. He was an intercessor. The Bible says in Genesis 18, Genesis 18, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? In Genesis 18, verse 17, The Lord revealed his secret plan to Abraham. He said, The city of Sodom and Gomorrah is, is, is great. The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Their sin is very grave. God was coming down to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the wickedness in the land. And Abraham stood in the cup. He stood before God and began to intercede for these two wicked cities. He said to God, he began to with 50. He said, 
Oh God, if only fifty of righteous people were found in this land, would you spare the land? God said, if I'm able to find fifty of righteous people, I will spare the land. He winded up with ten, but he could not find ten righteous people. Abraham interceded for these two wicked cities. Yes, judgment still came, but Abraham was willing to stand in the gap and intercede on behalf of these two wicked cities. And because of that, the masses of God were released. Lot and his two daughters escaped judgment. It was not the goodness of Lot that created his deliverance. It was the memory of God regarding Abraham's intercession. Moses was a man who stood in the gap too. There are numerous times in the Old Testament of God revealing his secret plan to destroy the children of Israel to Moses and Moses pleading with God to spare the people. Bible says in Psalms 106 verse 23, it says, Therefore, he would have destroyed them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the bleach to turn away his wrath. He says he stood before him to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. No matter what situation, there is still hope for America. There is hope for the other nations of the world. There is hope for Africa. There is hope for South America. There is hope for the European countries. There is still hope for salvation. For these nations to be able to see the glory of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms, in Psalms chapter 2, verse 8, Ask of me. God said, Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. And the other version says, Ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possessions. For your possessions. See, an intercessor is a man or woman or a child who fights on behalf of others. As such intercession is an activity that identifies us most with Christ. To be an intercessor is to be like Jesus. That is what Jesus is like. He ever lives to intercede. So every believer is called to be a part of the army of intercessors. We are all called to pray and intercede. And in order to understand the ministry of intercession, we need to understand the work of Jesus, the greatest intercessor. The greatest intercessor. Jesus said in John chapter 9 verse 4, that I must work the works of him who sent me. Jesus clearly understood that there were things he must do. And as Christians, we must be imitators of Christ. Because over and over in the scriptures, we see that Christ went away all night in a solitary place to pray. The Bible says in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, at very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6 verse 12, that it came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to the mountains to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. He continued all night in prayer to God. So his whole life was intercessory. If Christ felt that it was important to intercede, how much more, how much more should we consider intercession a priority? We must learn to intercede to become like Jesus. You see, we have an enemy, only someone who is, a, who is not aware of this creates a lifestyle without the consciousness of an adversary. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he said, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So the Apostle Paul defines our enemy this way in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
So he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That you put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wires of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, God spoke through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7. He said, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall not hold their peace day or night. He said, you who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. He said, I have said to watchmen. See, it is said that Jerusalem is a walled city. And people still walk on top of these walls. Watchmen used to walk up and down these walls. And look into the distance through prayer. They look, they would look through the night and guard against the potential attacks of the enemy that may come upon those cities. And so in these verses, God is telling us today to look into the distance through prayer and guard against the potential attacks of the enemy that may come upon our cities, upon our families, upon our churches. If we look into the distance through prayer. See, God is establishing his people as watchmen to give him no rest until the kingdom of God is established throughout the world. Throughout the world. And so all we have to do is say to God, is say, Lord, we are willing. Use us. If you are willing to stand in the gap, if you are willing to become a watchman, to fight on behalf of your nation, to fight on behalf of the people, to consecrate yourself in prayer and cry out to God for revival. All you have to do is say, Lord, I am willing. I am willing, Lord, use me. In Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible tells us how Isaiah had the voice of the Lord. And when he had God speak, all he had to say was, say, Lord, here I am, send me. In Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says that it was in the year King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord. He was sitting on the roof of the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphims, each having six wings, and two wings they covered their faces, two wings they covered their feet, and two wings they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of the heavens' armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Isaiah said, Isaiah the prophet, he said, it's all over. He said, I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among the people with filthy lips, yet I have seen the king, the Lord of the heaven's armies. And the Bible says that one of the seraphim, Threw to him with a bunny call that picked from the altar with a pair of tongues and touched the lips of Isaiah. And he says, See, this call has touched your lips. Your sins are forgiven. Your guilt is removed. And after the cleansing, Isaiah the prophet had the voice of the Lord. He had God speaking. Whom should I send as a messenger to these people? He said, Who will go for us? And Isaiah the prophet said, here I am, sin. Here I am, sin. Now, that's all we have to do. We say, God, use us. Here we are. We surrender, God. Use us. The Bible tells us that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek thy face and turn away from their wicked ways, will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land? This scripture is telling us that God will entirely heal our nation if we humble ourselves and pray. It's an astonishing insight that God's people are so disconnected from him that they have to be commanded to pray. One would think that if we are his people, we would be communicating with him on a regular basis. Yet he calls us to pray, promising that if we do, then there will be answers. 
See, revival is God's people praying again. Revival is God's people praying again. The Bible says, seek my face and turn. Which means God's face is discovered in prayer. The power to turn from evil is discovered in prayer. Without prayer, we are powerless. Evil gains ground in the prayer of the soul. So in prayer, we find desire and strength to destroy sin's power over us. We can be told that sin's power is already broken over us. But this victory really only materializes in prayer. It is the difference between knowing the work of the cross and experiencing it. So if our spiritual life is strong, then we are empowered to do what God wants. The ability to surrender, the capacity to do the will of God requires the fuel of the Spirit, which fuels us as we pray, which fuels us as we pray. This is not a prayer of a single person. It is a prayer of a people. If we get ourselves together in prayer, united for the same purpose, then we will unleash the greatest power of the kingdom. Entire nations will be healed through the power of a gathered praying church. God promised that our nations will be delivered, favored, restored, and healed if we, the people of God, in all the nations of the world, will call upon Him. 